سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين رضوان الله تعالى على اصحابه الراشدين المباركين والتابعين لهم بخير واحسن الى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين lecture us on the content of his uh, recent book for sacred activism which is a critically important book in this day and in this time that i might add particularly here in new york but certainly around the uh, around the country uh we are now in the second day of uh february and uh that means that we're right at the beginning of Black History Month, also known as African American History Month. And as I began to observe and become aware of uh, Imam Dawood's two books on centering uh, the black narrative with regards to the early generation of Muslims, May uh, Allah's favor be upon them all. I, being an elder in the community, I could not help but think uh, with gratitude how long it has taken us as a people to evolve to this point. And that's what it is. It's a matter of evolution. Uh, the month-long events, although here at MIB we always say, you know, uh, every month is Black History Month. Yeah. But the um, uh, African American History Month started off as a week, <laughs> implemented by an uh, esteemed educator, Carter G. Woodson, who, being an educator, saw the tremendous vacuum that existed in education with regards to uh, acknowledging the legacy of contribution of uh, African people to American history and to global civilization. And so um, uh, he started this week, and now it has you know, evolved from a Negro history <laughs> to uh, a black history uh, 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 month. But those early ancestors of ours, 20th century ancestors, were fiercely, fiercely dedicated to uncovering uh, this legacy, the legacy I mentioned. And uh, by way of introducing Imam Daoud, uh, I want to say one, Carter G. Wilson wrote a book entitled The Negro in Our History. You know, these are books written like 60 years ago. You know, Carter G. Woodson, J. Rogers, people like that. And in their works, and I mention them because many of the Muslim millennials, they never heard of me. Never heard of J. Rogers, never heard of Carter G. Woodson never heard of uh, Drusilla, mm. Dungey, Houston, you know, and, and, and these are people who, uh, they were Christians, and they were writing about Muslim contributions to black history. Uh, I personally, uh, the first time I ever heard of uh, our ancestor, Ayub Suleiman. Mm -hmm. uh, was in Carter G. Woodson's book, The Negro in Our History. Mm -hmm. uh, in the many writings of J. Rogers, from uh, World's Great Men of Color, which could really be called World's Great Men and Women of Color, because he's got men and women in there. And there are several Muslims whose biography is chronicled in that work. Uh, uh, Jay Rogers wrote a three-volume work, mm -hmm. massive anthropological <coughs> work entitled Sex and Race, mm -hmm. in which he is chronicling the history of the ancient peoples of the world. And again, several chapters in there on, on uh, uh, Muslims, particularly Muslims, uh, African-descendant Muslims, not only on the continent, but in 
other parts of the uh, world. And I was thinking the other day about the uh, uh, the wonderful Kushites of the ancient Ethiopian Empire, a book written by uh, Drusilla Dungey Houston. And I actually remember reading a chapter from that book shortly before I took my Shahada, which was back uh, in 1971. No, I'm an elder. I don't, you know. When you see me pausing, I'm just pausing to remember. <laughs> I'm not here, you know, because that was like 48 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in her book, she has, amongst other things, she has a chapter uh, in her book, which I read, about the, the, the African settlement of the Arabian Peninsula, okay? And... I was astounded to read it. Whoa, look at this. And she talked about the contributions of what she called uh, uh, Kushite Arabs and Semitic Arabs and distinguish the two. You know, not to mention, you know, contributions in language and culture and civilization, mm -hmm. etc. So someone might ask, well, you know, why is this important or is this important? only for one group of people. No, this is important for all groups of people. Because the same way that American educational institutions tend to obscure the contributions of our people, we find the same thing happening throughout the world. Let me give you one last uh, example and then uh, introduce our speaker. So up in the Bronx is um, and I'm from Guinea. His name is uh, Imam Junaid, the younger brother of our late brother, Imam Saudi Wujat. <laughs> so the day of Imam Saudi Wujat's Janaza, we had left Masjid Abdul Muqtah Khalifa, several of you were there. We're driving to the cemetery. And uh, somehow, and I'm riding with Imam Junaidi and other continental African imams. So somehow, we started discussing uh, Al Jahis, Rahim Allah, who is a massive polymath figure in Muslim history and in global history. And uh, so Imam Junaidi, who is a graduate of Assad University, has two PhDs, very educated person. So he said to us, he said, he said, Imam, I have to tell you something. He said, all during the time that I was studying at Assad, and he also went to the University of Medina, he said, we uh, studied the works and the writings of uh, Al Jahis. He said, it wasn't until I got to America that I found out that Al Jahis was a black man. I said, imagine that. And, and you know, there are many scholars who consider Al Jahis to be like on the, uh, a peer of Al Ghazali. I mean, you're really on that type level. And, uh, and he said, you know, and this often happens, you know, when people get to America, they start hanging around those of us of African descent who did not come here voluntarily. They, lead, they learn their history. And then I like to say, you know, to me, we enlighten them and send them back. You know, Kwame Nkrumah came here, went, went to African American college, went back staunch advocate of that African. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Fela came here, hanging out, playing Afro beat music and stuff. Went, went to California, got him a black power African American girlfriend. <laughs> went back to Africa, had been in trouble ever since. <laughs> you know, but because this is this is what we do. We have a responsibility to make sure that the peoples of the world know about this history. And so, uh, having said that, we're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that we have uh, Imam Daoud Wali to lecture us. I'm sorry, there's one other thing I must mention. I'm sure we've all seen the photograph of the Hajj Malika Shabazz, Malcolm X, Rahmatullah Ali, uh, that was taken in Nigeria, in which he's standing in the uh, robes and traditional uh, turban of the Sokoto Khalife. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have seen that photograph, <coughs> okay? So, one of his priorities, one of the priorities of the post-nation of Islam, Malcolm X, priorities of a Hajj Malik of Shabazz, was the centering in the minds of Muslims in America an African-centered or black-centered narrative. He was very concerned about that. It was one of his, uh, one of the five or six <coughs> priorities that he had in his work that was cut short. That's why he took that photograph. He was modeling. He was saying, listen, we're Muslims. We're going to be attracted to Islam. Our people accepted Islam left and right. But we are not Arabs, mm -hmm. and we are not accepting, you, you know, Islam in order to embrace someone else's heritage mm -hmm. um, and not embrace our own, you know, speaking on an ethnic level, cultural level, uh, etc. So now we have evolved as a people to the point where we are producing from amongst ourselves scholars, both men and women, who have the tools, who have the, the chops, who have the, the skills, you know, to be able uh, in the Arabic language, I hope you know our real history is not written in English, mm -hmm. it's not written in French, mm -hmm. it's not written in any of, uh, I was at a lecture of Sheikh Mahi Sise about 20 years ago, and he said, you know, it's not written in any of the colonial languages. That's right. You have to go back, when you go to Timbuktu, and you walk through those libraries, as I have, and you look there, our people's history, scientific texts, philosophical texts, uh, etc., are written in the Arabic language. Mm -hmm. And so again, we, we welcome uh, <coughs> Imam Daoud uh, Wali for his lecture tonight, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, uh, reward him for his work, and now let us open our ears and our hearts uh, to his presentation. Dear believers, assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala seyyidina wa habibina Muhammadin we begin customarily praising and thanking Allah, the guardian evolver, cherish the sustainer, the Lord of the universe, and we seek the blessings and the peace upon our master and our beloved Muhammad. And these blessings and peace also be upon his purified, wholesome household. And may Allah be well pleased with his rightly guided and blessed companions. And all of those who follow them in goodness and spiritual beauty until the day of resurrection. And may Allah, may Allah make us among them through the grace of his mercy. He who is the most merciful of those who can show mercy. First of all, uh, before I begin the topic, let me say to Imam Talib and also to the Imams, the students of knowledge in this room, honorable brothers and sisters, it's really my honor and privilege to be here uh, in Harlem at this historic masjid, which we know was born out of the seed that was planted by our dear beloved brother Al Hajj Malik al Shabazz, Rahmatullahi Ta Ali. Amen. And um, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to 
grant him the fullness of the reward of all that he done for Muslims, not just here in the United States of America, but in Trinidad and Jamaica, to Palestine, to Pakistan, and the, the global impact that he still continues to make, where not only people convert or revert to Islam through reading his book, but even Muslims who were born to Muslim households who've lost the spirit of Islam have gotten reconnected back to the deen through reading his autobiography. I know several who say that they had uh, came up with the Islam that didn't have any taste or any velk. And it was dry. And how they got their beak wet was reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, which then took them further into spiritual purification and back to the true essence of this dean. Um, so we're going to have a brief talk about uh, relating to these two books, uh, Centering Black Narrative, Black Muslim Nobles Among the Early Pious Muslims, which came out in February 2017, and its sequel that came out a little over a month ago, Centering Black Narrative, Ahlul Bayt, Blackness in Africa. Ahlul Bayt, uh, nomenclature meaning the prophetic household, the household and the descendants of our beloved Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. Uh, it is important that anytime you have an author that is alive and amongst you and discusses their book, you, you, that it would be good. It is important that anytime you have an author that is alive and amongst you and discusses their book, you, you, that it would be good to learn the circumstances that inspired the author or authors to write their texts, right? Uh, that gives a little background into what motivates the text and some background as far as the, the framework. So uh, anti-blackness, as we all know, is real, right? And it is shameful when a group of people look down and mistreat another group of human beings. Or a group of Muslims look down at another group of Muslims simply due to phenotype or ethnic or tribal background in which that's the color of Allah because none of us had any control over who our parents were, what land we were born in, what language they spoke, uh, whether we have uh, white skin, yellow skin, red skin, mildly brown skin, brown skin, or black skin, whether our hair is straight, wavy, curly, or kinky. Like, none of us had any control over that. So it's really shameful when human beings and Muslims do that. But that's not the primary reason that sparked us to write this book. It's one thing when a people hate you for who you are. It's another thing when a group of people are involved in self-loathing and actually have self-hatred. That's really bad. When people can't see themselves or see other people, or in this case of Muslims, see other Muslims as inherently superior to themselves. Um, that's bad. And, and not in lip service, but in attitudes and behaviors because we can try to fake it with what we say, but how we operate with each other and deal with each other is as they're saying, the proof is in the pudding, right? Maybe I shouldn't use that reference to brothers in prison right now, but uh, you understand what I'm saying, right? So that's, that's part of what uh, sparked the writing of this book. Mention, he mentioned El Jahid, which was a great scholar uh, he's a theologian, master of the Arabic language, uh, poet, uh, also a historian. Yes. See, he wrote, that's the word polymath. He was a master at several different disciplines within the Islamic sciences, not just one. Uh, he was a contemporary in Iraq. He was a historical temporary around the time period of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, which is the fourth of the four Imams of the Sunni schools of thought, or what we call Fuqaha, the jurists. This is his time frame. Uh, El Jahid wrote a treatise 
first dealing with this issue because he noticed uh, black self-loathing. Jalaluddin Esuyuti, several centuries later, wrote two books about this. And Jalaluddin Esuyuti was an Arab, an Egyptian. He wrote two books relating this issue because he noticed this. Then the the one who wrote the largest book on this, probably the most authoritative, which is one of the primary sources of this book, uh, Abul Farraj Ibn al Jawzi al Hanbali from Greater Syria. He wrote a book describing this issue of self-black loathing, and he wasn't black, but he wrote a book because the, the spiritual doctors want to cure the sicknesses of the psyche. It doesn't matter your skin color. They want to deal with the issues that afflict the hearts, right, in the psyches of, 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 of human beings, right? And he was in Bilal Sham or Greater Syria, Ibn al-Jawzi, right? So, he wrote a book called Tenwil Ghabish Fi Fali Sudan Wa Habish, right? It's basically uh, the illumination of the blacks and their merits from the Abyssinians and the Sudanese. Basically how we can translate this, this work. Uh, it's in Arabic, the whole book hasn't been translated and uh, really you can only find the book. Uh, it's been preserved and put in a PDF file but if you were to go to the average bookstore, and I've looked for a hard copy, I have the PDF. If you go to bookstores in Medina, uh, I was just in Morocco a month ago. If you look in the bookstores in uh, Casablanca, or in Fez, or in Meknes, or in Cairo, Egypt, you can't find this book. Which makes you wonder why they don't publish the book. You, that's a good question, right? Why don't they publish the book, right? Jamal Azhar, you can't even get the book. And Jamal Azhar at the bookstores across from the Azhar. Why not? Uh, you know, it's just something to think about. So, he mentions this companion, this relating to self loathing before I get into more of the book, about number one. There was a companion by the name of Jule Bib. Wadi Allahu Anhu. Jule Bib. Um, Much better. Julie Beeb didn't have any family. He was in Medina. He had no family with him in Medina. Um, Julie Beeb is described in the book of Tariq or the biographies of companions of the Prophet. He's described by Sahabi Abu Barza. He, his description is very interesting. Abu Barza described this Sahabi Julie Beeb as Kana Qasiran Adam Ulaun Damiman. Short, black, and very ugly. As I described. Or almost like to the point of saying he looked deformed almost. Short, black, and ugly. He called short, black, and ugly. Um, the Prophet وسلم, came across Julie Beeb. Now remember, he was self loathing. He asked a question. This was the self loathing. This self-loathing of his identity caused him a crisis of faith. He began to question his own Islam. The Prophet saw him sitting alone, alayhi salam, saw him looking depressed. Julie Bib asked our beloved a difficult question. The question was, can a man like me of my low status enter into the paradise? <coughs> So he began to question whether he was worthy of Allah's paradise in the next life because he felt as if Allah's ni'mah, his favor, wasn't on him in this life. So the prophet was like, of course. And he asked him, why? Why you ask this question? And he said, because none of the people in the Medina, none of the Muslims, will allow me to get married because Eric, he, he couldn't marry. No one will allow him to marry one of their daughters. This guy they call short, black, and ugly. He described as being short, black, and ugly, I should say. Now, this is a Muslim who prayed five times a day. It's a Muslim who paid his zakat. There's a Muslim who fasted Ramadan. This is a Muslim who went on the ghazawat, who went on the campaigns to be allowed to protect the Ummah. 
Yet he questioned whether he could go to the paradise. Keep in mind, we're talking about what inspired me to write this, well, us to write this book. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa loving his companions, said, I got you. This is a 21st century <laughs> translation, uh, shah, or explanation of hadith. So he went to the home of one of the Ansar and knocked on the door. The father, or the man of the house, opened the door. He sees God's beloved at the door. He said, what brings you to our home? It's an honor, the messenger of God coming to your home. He said, I've come to your home for marriage. The Ansari is very happy. The Prophet والسلام, said, I didn't come for myself. <laughs> he says in Arabic, Li man. Then for who? Jule Bib. He said, I came on behalf of Jule Bib. The Ansari man says, Hold on, I have to go get my wife. He has to go get his wife. Right, so this, so you know, talk to my wife about this. So he brings his wife. And by the way, this isn't, we can't say this is a way of him trying to get out of giving an answer because the culture of Mecca was different from the culture of Medina. So in Sariat were known to be strong women. The women in Mecca were known not to be as outspoken, but the women of the Ansar were known to be outspoken in Sariat. Right? So there's a cultural difference in the Arabs, even from Mecca to Medina. Right, so we can't even look and say like, oh, all Arabs, Arabic culture. There is no such thing as monolithic Arabic culture. Right. The Adnani and Qatanis back at 1400 years ago didn't have monolithic culture. And Arabs today, from Yemen to Lebanon, you might say they're Arab, but they are, are, are a kind of different culture. They're, even their lahja, their dialect of Arabic is even different, right? So the woman of the house comes. So, oh, messenger of God, you're here. See, I've come for marriage. And she's happy. So not for me. For who? I come on behalf of Julie B. She said, back to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Now I'm not going to allow to marry my daughter to marry Julie B. You know, because he's known to be Kana Qasirun Adamu Laun Damiman. Aswadu Laun, excuse me. Kana Qasirun Aswadu Laun Damiman. Short, black, and ugly. Esudulahum Damima. The young lady, their daughter then comes out. <coughs> and she's like, oh, the messenger of Allah has come to the home. The mother said, yeah, the messenger of Allah wants you to marry this man, Julie B, but I'm never am I going to be happy for you to marry this man, Julie B. And she says, how can I refuse a proposal that comes from the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Then she marries Julay B. And the Prophet arranged many of these types of marriages. Right with Sa'ad al Aswad, mentioned him in the book of Al Miqdad ibn al Aswad, Salman the Persian. A number of the Sahaba who weren't Arab had problems getting a wife. Not just the black, like Salman the Persian had a problem with getting married. Right? And there are others that have problems. Um, so they get married. Then Julay Bib goes out on a ghazwa. He gets married, he has to go. Because the Muslim Ummah has to be defended. When the ghazwa is over, the Prophet وسلم, he's inquiring Is everyone back? Is everyone back? Because he wanted to know. All the people who went out al jihad al fisabilah, if they were coming back, or are there any martyrs that were left behind? So he says, everyone back. Everyone's not back yet. Everyone's back yet. Not everyone's not back yet. Everyone's not back yet. Where's Julie B? Where's Julie B? He goes to the battlefield. Julie B. He finds Julie B. Martyred on the battlefield. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam goes over to Julie Beep, starts crying, and says, Heather mini wa ana minhu. This man's from me and I'm from him. Now this was a man who questioned his own faith of whether he'd go to paradise. He had self-loathing. 
He questioned whether he could go, go to paradise through the assistance of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and through Allah's fadl, through His grace, this man became shaheed. Shaheed are at the highest level of the Jannah. Bihail he said, with no reckoning. So a man who questioned where he go to Jannah, he's of the people of a gentle Firdaus are Allah right now. Now, if a companion could go in self-loathing and question their Islam, some a, a one of, of the one of the Sahaba, the best generation, who come face to face and see the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And if they question their Iman, their Islam, and have self-loathing, then good God, what about us 1,400 years later? Over 1,400 years later. What about us? When we can get into this thing. Now, we're talking about centering black narrative. One of the things that we had to clarify in the, in volume number one, our beloved brother Ustad Abdullah Ali, who's a professor of Islamic law at Zaytuna College, may Allah preserve him, wrote the introduction for volume number one. And we dealt with another chapter too. One of the biggest misconceptions that we have to deal with that Imam Talib alluded to was this whole issue of blackness and Arabness. Many people believe blackness and Arabness are mutually exclusive. They aren't mutually exclusive to this day. But historically speaking, blacks were considered to be. I mean, Arabs were considered to be among the blacks. The original Arabs. So there's three groups of Arabs, historically. You have first the ancient Arabs. The Arabs of Ad and Thamud. They were destroyed for their disobedience to Allah. They were destroyed. Then you have the second generation of Arabs, whose asl or whose roots are in Yemen in southern Yemen, or what he was referring to was called in a different language of anthropology, the Kushite Arabs, right? <coughs> in the language of anthropology. But the Arabs of of, uh, of the southern part of Yemen, because you know, even when we think about the map, we have to decolonialize our minds. Right. We think of the Ar Arabian Peninsula as something separate from Africa. Right. Even if you look at a map before, if you believe in the theory of plate tectonics, you'll see that the Arabian Peninsula connects directly with Africa. Right. And if you, it's only a very short boat paddle <laughs> from ancient Abyssinia to the southern part of Yemen. And to this day, our brothers and sisters in, in Yemen, may Allah protect them, when they escape from Yemen on boats or speed boats, they're going right to Djibouti. Djibouti, Somalia, Eritrea, and Ethiopia make up ancient Habesha, or the ancient Abyssinian kingdom. So there was always connections back and forth, right? So the original Arabs even saw themselves as being black. And I will give you some proofs behind this. And we, and we have all of our receipts in the book or Dalia, we have receipts, because people want to question it, you see, but, and we've had even some Arabs question this thing, but when we bring the receipts, then if they deny the receipts, then that just means you just straight out anti-black. If you're going to, if you're going to deny the hadith, you know, if you're going to deny it, then you're just straight up just showing, you know, you've got a, a spiritual problem. Um, so, hadith is authenticated, narrated by Imam al-Hakim in his uh, book, Al-Mustadrik. And it's been authenticated by a Zahabi. So it's Hadith Sahih. Like, this isn't anything that someone can say, oh, this is weak. But the whole position of Hadith that are weak, that's worthy for a whole other subject. Because it's because someone says the Hadith is weak doesn't mean the Prophet them didn't say it, didn't act upon it. That's a, that's, that's a whole other lecture. So it's some, some brothers of certain orientations want to dismiss things saying, oh, that's da'if. But well, we won't get into that right here. Okay, even this is... is, 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 is legit. <laughs> Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a dream. And in this dream, and dream is, by the way, part of revelation. Right. Dream is part of revelation. 
And there are people to this day who aren't getting wahi, but there are people to this day who have ilham, who have a type of inspiration from Allah Azza wa Jal. There are people who have truthful dreams to this day uh, amongst Allah's awliya, amongst his friends. For some trans it is his saints. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is walking uh, as a shepherd, as shepherds do, and all of God's prophets were shepherds. May God uh, be, uh, have his peace and blessings be upon all of them. Because being a shepherd teaches you how to lead and be meek with the flock. And also to protect the sheep from wolves. So he's walking behind the sheep. And all the sheep are black. They're all black sheep that the prophet's walking behind. Then some white sheep then start coming up into the black sheep. And then eventually the white sheep overtake and number the black sheep. He says this to Abu Bakr as Siddiq. He tells him this dream. So what are you telling this dream? What do you think about this dream? Abu Bakr Siddiq's visceral response was, the black sheep are the Arabs, and the white sheep are the Ajit, the non-Arabs. Non-Arabs of that day, or Ajimi, was predominantly used for people, especially who were Persian. The Prophet said back to Abu Bakr Siddiq, he said, your interpretation is true for certainly a malik or an angel told me the exact same meaning. Which means it must have been common knowledge that blackness was associated with Arabness. Now, in basically every Arabic lexicon, one of the most authoritative ones is called Nisan al-Arab. But Ibn Mandur, Rahmatullah Ta'ali. He writes in this, in Imam Al Nawawi, Rahmatullah Ta'ali, a great also hadith scholar. Many of you have read his book of 40 hadith that have been translated. Riyadh al Salihin, other texts that he's given, commentaries on a Sahih Muslim. Uh, you've all read his, his work. May Allah reward him tremendously. They say regarding the hadith, I was sent to Bu'ithu illa al Aswad wal Ahmar. I was sent to the black and the red. It's not like trying to lie, uh, it's white, but the red. They give interpretations of this. Or he gives an explanation of this. If you look at the word Ahmar, which means red. Actually, the word himar is related to this too, means donkey. Ahmar. He says that it is known amongst the Arabs that when they say Ahmar or the reds, this speaks of two people. It speaks to the Persians and Kamurum, the people of the Byzantine Empire, white folks, when Ahmar is used. And it's understood that when Aswad is used, it, it relates to the Al Ahbash, the Ethiopians, as well as the Nubians, and the Arabs. This is in the commentaries of what, who, who is Al Ahmar, who are the Reds. And many commentators of the Hadith have mentioned this issue relating to, I was sent, including Al Jahid mentioned this as well, I was sent to the black and the red. Now, cementally speaking, of one of the most authentic narrations, including this is what our Salafi brothers say from Albani, that Imam Ahmed bin Hamdul in his Musnad, he narrates a hadith, and this relates to the farewell sermon. You all know it. There is no virtue of the black or I mean, there's no virtue of the Arab over the non-Arab. Nor the Arab, the non-Arab over the Arab. Let's, I want you to follow the sequence. Because this is a, this is a semantical issue. For those of you, uh, explain something to you about the Arabic language. Come on now. 
There is no virtue of the Arab over the non-Arab, nor the non-Arab over the Arab. And there is no virtue of the black over the white, nor virtue of the white over the black, except in taqwa, in consciousness. So you look at the order, Arab, non-Arab, black, white. Understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Arab, non-Arab. Non-Arab, Arab. Black, white, white, black. This is a, uh, a type of uh, balaka type of thing. You have a similar eye in the Quran where you can see a similarity when you see opposites, right? Well, Allah says in the Quran, ta'awnu ala birri wa taqwa so it says cooperate with each other based upon ilbir <coughs> noble characteristics and at taqwa regardfulness but do not cooperate with each other based upon il ism sinful matters and el udwan or enmity so you see that in this uh, context you will see that the opposite of ilbir or piety is el ism sinful matters was well haram and you will see the opposite of a taqwa is in this ayah is, is el udwan is enmity, <coughs> right? Is enmity, and the greatest enmity is having enmity towards the command of Allah Azawajal. That's the greatest enmity that one can have. May Allah Azawajal make us be amongst His beloved and of His friends, and not make us be amongst His enemies. So this is a um, this is an issue. So just know and understand that this issue we're talking about blackness, and even when you read the prophetic traditions or the sayings of the early Arabs, we can't get caught and look at things in modern or postmodern European or Western constructs of race. Right. Right, because we look at black one way and look at it from uh, uh, the, the two Bob perspectives that he gave us. It's a wolf off word, Mandinka. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, two Bob. <coughs> we can't look at the Islamic tradition and the ahadith and the sayings of the Sahaba and Tabi'een. We can't look at those words and, and put these these constructs that were defined by people who never meant us any good. Right? So, so again, we have to decolonialize even how we read the, 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 the literature. Right? Go back to the original sources as they were understood originally. Okay? So that's one thing we want to clear up in the book. Blackness and, Arabis, and Arabness have never been mutually exclusive. Now, Bayan number two, Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet's family, alayhi salam, the Hashemites as they're called, Banu Hashem, Banu Hashem, from the nation of Quraysh. Let's deal with their blackness, and then I'll talk about their merits and in for Q&A. So, you never find anyone saying, questioning the Arabness of Bani Hashim. Because that would be questioning the Arabness of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his ancestors, right? No one was going to question that. So, the leader of Ahlul Bayt, after the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is Sayyiduna Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah ennoble his countenance. May Allah ennoble his countenance. The man the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ana dar al-hikmati wa aliyun babuha. Then there's secrets in this. He said, the Prophet said, I am the city of a knowledge and Ali is its gate, or Ali is its door. And another narration that says, I am the city of, uh, no, I am the I am the house of wisdom, excuse me. And adult to hikmati, I am the house of wisdom. 
and Ali is its door. And he says, and none can come into the house except entering through the door. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi I am the city of knowledge, and Ali is its gate. Ali is its door. So you can't go to the Islamic spiritual tradition and bypass Sayyidina Ali. Nope. And that's why there's some people who are adverse against the Tazkiyah and the spiritual teachers of Tazkiyah because they all trace back to Sayyidina Ali. All of them do. So you, you have to see there's some, there's some, when you'll see that there's some people when they have certain strange beliefs or gets uh, emphasizing spiritual purification, you also see they have a subtle uh, hatred or enmity towards Sayyidina Ali and Ahlul Bayt. You'll see it. And that's another reason why we run right second to we did. We introduced back to the people of the Sunnah the proper position and reverence of Ahlul Bayt. Sayyidina Ali is the Imam of Ahlul Bayt after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's narrated in hadith. It raised up to the level, it's so widely narrated, it basically rises to the level of what we call mutawatir. So there's different levels of hadith. You have a hadith that could be sahih. But when something gets to uh, mutawatir, it is so widely narrated, it is beyond doubt. In other words, to reject it, to, re to reject it, and I want to emphasize this, to reject it borders on being blasphemous. Okay? In Medina after Ghazwa Khaybar, with less major campaigns, the Prophet is in the house of Umm Salama, may Allah be well pleased with the mother of the believers, Umm Salama. And Fatima comes in the house, Ali has salam, and her two sons, the beloved grandsons, Al Hassan and Al Hussein. May Allah be well pleased with them. And the Sayyidina Ali is in this house. Our Prophet had a black kisa, a black cloak that he got while in Khaybar. He has it. He wraps it around himself and them. And then a portion of an ayah, and Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd ayah, is revealed. Inna yuridullahu li yuthiba ankum ritsa ahlu bayt wa yutahhirukum tatira. That surely God, surely Allah, desires but to purify you, O people of the household from any ridges, from any filth, meaning the filth of sin, the filth of disobedience, the filth of kufr, and give you a thorough purification. Which means it's, it's actually, in Arabic language, it's not the perfect tense. It's not fitl madi, it's, fit, it's fitl mudari. It's imperfect tense, meaning it's still ongoing right now. It's ongoing to the day of judgment. The purification of Ahlul Bayt. Peace be upon them. So he's with those five people. And then he says, Allahumma ha'ulai ahli. O Allah, these are the people of my household. Those five people. Now, of course, the, 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 the family's blood, the prophet, peace be upon him, his blood kin, is much bigger than that. And of course, he has his honorable wives who are called Umahatul Mu'min, the mothers of believers. But the heart of Ahlul Bayt is after the Prophet is Ali, Imam Ali, Wa Fatima Zahra, Wa Hassan, Wa Hussein. May Allah be well pleased with them. And he is the Imam. He is the spiritual. He is a, a spiritual inheritor of our beloved. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
how is Sayyidina Ali primarily described in books? The majority description of Sayyidina Ali in the books of the Sunni Muslims is he's described as Kana Adam Shadid al Udma. Kana Adam Shadid al Udma. So let's break this down. Adam also can mean Asmar or brown. Right now, according to Arabic or how Arabs understood words back then, like I'm a black man, right? But my skin color is Adam Mortadil. I'm light brown. I'm not brown. So we're talking about a little darker than me. Then Shadid is an intensifier. It means strong. El Udma is a mesdar, a mesdar coming from Adam. So it's an intensifier. So basically we're talking about brown upon brown. So Sayyidina Ali was basically chocolate in skin color. Right. Sayyidina Ali's skin co color, Kremallahu Wajah, was basically Wesley Snipes. Right. <laughs> but he's Arab. His, his father, Abu Talib, is Arab. His mother, Fatima, Arab. Arab. He's Arab from Bani Hajar. Okay? Yes, he's described. The lightest that he's described, and, and, and even according in the Shia books uh, of the of the twelve verse, like Bihar and Wad about a majesty, or in uh, some of the books of of, of Azadiya, is that he was at the lightest Adam, meaning he was just he was brown. Right, he's brown. And also, in Lisan Arab, this is the primary description, description of how Arabs, when you look up Arab, and how Arabs are described, they were primarily described as, as Sumar wa Udma. They're described as being brown and dark brown. Primary description of Arabs. And we're not saying these things out of fakr or trying to have like some black pride thing, right? We're saying this out of, his, first of all, we should still tell history accurately for the sake of having sidq, of truthfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But number two, we're talking about the self-loathing, right? It's important for us to see ourselves in the narrative of Islamic history, right? Prophets came to all nations, and we'd look when we're talking about the awliya of God, they look like the children of Adam too. So we have to be accurate, okay? We have to be accurate, especially for what we've gone through here for the last 400 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, Miss uh, Karachi Woodson wrote that also wrote about the miseducation of the Negro. Mm -hmm. You know, in the updated cover, you see a, bl a black man on the cover with a chain and a lock, right? So, you know, we can be physically unshackled and be psychologically shackled. Dr. Naeem Akbar wrote about this too, breaking the chains of psychological slavery. That's a classic yeah. from back in the day. Yeah. Now, this is Sayyidina Ali. And I could keep going on and on about his merits. Sayyidina Hussein, the martyr of Karbala. The martyr of Karbala. He is described in the books, and we have the sources in here in Arabic. He described as being brown skin with Waj Jamil with a with a handsome face, right? Tall, dark and handsome. <laughs> Sayyidina Hussein. Sayyidina Ali, after the death of Fatima Zahra, married a woman. And she's described as Kenneth Sindia Sauda. She's described as being a woman with black skin from the area of Sindh. If you know modern geography, Sindh is Pakistan. Right. It's in Pakistan. And we know in the subcontinent in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, there's people there darker than a lot of us in this room, right? We know that. We know that, right? We know that. So she gave birth to a son by the name of Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. He described as Kana Adam Shadid al Udma or Kana Aswadul He had black skin. He's Hashemite because Arabness, Arab is not a race. Arabness is about you have 
number one, paternal lineage to an Arab. Mm -hmm. And then number two, you have some sort of cultural connection to Arabs, which is, which is normally some usage of the Arabic language. It's not a race. That's why, hence, you can have the new Arabs of the Arabized Arabs, uh, like Palestine, <coughs> who can be very light, or Lebanon, like in the mountains. Uh, Islam came and spread there and Arabized the people when Arab men married the women there and began to be getting lighter and lighter over time. They're Arab. So are brothers in Sudan, in Khartoum. They're Arabs. And classically speaking, the Arabs of old look closer to Sudanese than they look to Syrians or Lebanese. Sayyidina uh, Ali, then his son Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, which, one, which, is a, which is a great scholar, and actually El Jahid chases back his knowledge or his uh, isnad and number of things back to Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Okay? Then we have, I'll mention a couple of more just to. Uh, just to uh, conclude, because we can go on. Plus, you need to get the, get the books. You can read for yourself. <laughs> um, one of the great spiritual masters in Islam. His maqam is in Baghdad. May Allah help our brothers and sisters in Iraq. They suffered so much. They suffered so much. Sayyid Abdul Qadir al Jilani, Qadr Salahu Ruh. May Allah sanctify his soul. Sayyid Abdul Qadir al Jilani al Hanbali, great Hanbali scholar, uh, great Gnostic, great spiritual doctor, great man. He himself is described as being Adam in the books when you read his history. He is a descendant of a man by the name of Musa El Joan. El Joan is a title which means the black. He is a descendant of Musa El Joan. Musa El Joan, Ibn, Ibn Abdullah El Kamil, Ibn Al Hassan Al Muthanna, Ibn Hassan Al Sipt, Ibn Amir Al Mu'minin Ali Ibn Abi Talib. This is his lineage. That's his paternal lineage. He is the son of Musa el Jaun, the son of Abdullah, who is one of the teachers of Imam Malik, one of the four fuqaha of the Sunnis, the son of Hassan II, the son of Hassan, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, the son of Ali ibn Talib, the commander of the believers. This is Abdul Qadir Jinnah's paternal lineage. His maternal lineage traces back to Imam Hussein. That's why he's called al Hassani al Hussein. He traces back paternally and maternally. Now, another man who is descendant maternally, who's Hassani, and I'll conclude with this. The great 19th century Senegambian scholar Sidi Touba, a Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba, Qadr Salahu Ruha. Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba was a reformer of his time in West Africa. He had many students, disciples. One thing that the colonists did systematically, it was the French, the British, the Italians, when they came to an area and wanted to colonialize it, they wanted to close down the madaris or the places where people learn Quran yep. in Arabic. And then they wanted to silence the scholars. As they unfortunately, even some of the Muslim countries today, they try to silence the scholars. They lock the scholars up or they pay scholars off. As Imam Saraj Wahaj, may Allah preserve him, Imam Saraj Wahaj at Meshit Taqwa, I heard him say, what he called scholars for dollars. <laughs> Okay. 
Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba believed in spiritual resistance to French occupation. He never picked up the sword. I told his Meridian to pick up the sword. And he had a dream where the Prophet came to him and summoned him to go to an area where no one was lived. I went to this area. It's a city now called Tuba. Tuba is the name of a tree in the Jannah. Tuba also means blessings or glad tidings. There's a hadith of our Prophet which is Sahih that says, Fatuba lil ghuraba. So glad tidings to the strangers. Fatuba lil ghuraba. See Tuba, Ahmadu Bamba had a dream about Tuba. Nothing was growing there. And the karama happened when he went there that he dug a well and brought forth water from that well. And to this day, that well is never dried. They even bottle the water. I've drank from this water. Right? When you think of it, when you think of it, it's also, it's kind of almost like a mirror. It's almost like a mirror of, 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 of Hajar Ismail alayhi salam. And you'll see this, that the awliya Allah, that many of them, they will be mirrors of certain mu'jizat of the prophets. Like you see, Sayyidina Hussein is a mirror or reflection of Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, of John the Baptist. Even their heads were brought to the exact same place where they were decapitated, in Damascus. They're a mirror of each other. I'm talking about the awliya Allah, this is important. Um, Si Tuba was then sent to exile in Gabon. Okay? And he dedicated, he was a master scholar. He wrote about Maliki Fiqh, he wrote about Arabic grammar, um, he wrote about the spiritual sciences, the spiritual purification, he made commentaries on hadith and, and verses of the Quran, but he dedicated the last years of his life to nothing but madih. Poetry in Arabic, primarily, some in Wolof, but majority in Arabic, praising the Prophet That was enough for him. That was suffice for him. When you go to Tuba, you will see it's something miraculous. He's probably the most prolific writer in the history of humankind. There is a, most of his writings we don't even know about or know the contents. There's a large library that is across from where he is buried, which is where the masjid is at. Imagine a huge building of nothing but writings from one author. That's Sidi Tuba. That's his maktaba. It's called Maktaba al Sheikh al Khadim. This was called Sin Tuba. You should go to Tuba. You should go to Senegal. Senegal is a special place. Senegal is a special place. Tuba, Kalech, Tiwawan, Medina Gunya, all these, these are some very special places. And to go to Gore Island, right out of Dakar. It is very special. You may find something there if you go. You may find something there if you go. I'm not talking about the material. To see Tuba, his mother, Mariamo Busso. Mariamo Busso traced her lineage back also through the lineage of Musa el Joan, back to Hassan ibn Ali, back to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Fatima al Zahra, to the Prophet. It's authenticated. His family is still there in Tuba and in Senegal, right? And the Boso family is still known to this family today, including the sisters of being memorizers of the Quran and teaching the Quran. There's something there, and these are Ahlul Quran. They teach the Quran. They memorize the Quran, right? So this is, uh, some of the uh, 
the lineage uh, of people that we wrote about and some of the characters or the personalities, I should say, that we wrote about in, uh, in the book. But I will conclude, and then we have some Q&A uh, relating to this last issue of, of Ahlul Bayt, because this has been used as Sheikh uh, Dr. Muhammad Yahya Ninawi, may Allah preserve him. Mm -hmm. So this issue has been used <coughs> as intellectual terrorism. It's been done for a long time because the people, the, 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 the people who want to defeat the Muslims, defeat the believers, I should say, know that they can't corrupt or defeat Islam from the outside, so they try to corrupt it from the inside. They try to corrupt it from the inside. And going back since the days after the martyrdom of Uthman ibn Affan, and you have within the martyrdom, or first before the martyrdom of Sayyidina Ali, there began people cursing Sayyidina Ali from the Manabar from the pulpits. And, and then the rebelled against him, and one of the Khawarij murdered Sayyidina Ali in Masjid al Kufa during the last part of Ramadan, right before the Fajr prayer, before the Akama. He was, he was stabbed with a poisonous dagger and died from the poison three days later. Well, not died, he was martyred. Because we don't say the Shuhada are dead. They're alive. He was martyred then, right? There's always been a campaign to try to marginalize them. Because people are, people are intimidated by their spiritual magnetism. To their spiritual magnetism. So if you talk about Ahlul Bayt, oh, oh, you, oh, uh, 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 Rafa, oh, you, 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 you Shia brother? You Ra, oh, Rafa D? You, 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 oh, you, you, you a de, you a deviant, huh? You, oh, or, 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 oh, you're a grave worshiper, a Kaburi, Kaburi, oh, you, oh, you worship graves, you know, you grave worshiper, right? I'm just highlighting this, you can understand the tactics, the tricks. Safety is in not relegating Ahlul Bayt. Safety and security is holding on tight to Ahlul Bayt. In conclusion, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the hadith is authentic. Inni tarikum fikum thakolain kitab Allahi wa itrati Ahlul Bayti. I have left behind for you two things, two heavy, weighty things. And this is the most authentic narration of the farewell sermon. Kitab Allahi wa Sunnati has a correct meaning, but it is not authentic in its isnad. The, the authentic isnad is Kitab Allah wa Itrati Ahlu Bayti. Hold on tightly to two things. If you hold on to them tightly, as Muslim says, and Sahih Muslim, if you hold on to them tightly, you shall never go astray after me. The Book of Allah and the people of my household. And then they will not separate from me until they meet me at El Haud and El Kalthar on the last day. Right? So this issue of Ahlul Bayt is an important issue relating to Aqidah and Iman. How will you be if you have dislike for Ahlul Bayt when Mahdi comes? Because Mahdi is son of Fatima Zahra. The, the, the one that's coming. He's from Ahlul Bayt. And the question is, what, and not whether you know Mahdi's name, is whether Mahdi will know us to accept us as being part of his troops. If we live to see coming of Mahdi. And not whether we know his name, and he was a descendant of Fatima, and we talk about he's going to come from, from Khorasan and go and get Bayat, the Kaaba, and all these fine details. That's, that's not what's most, that it's important, but what's most important is, are we going to be counted amongst his people? Right? And if you have enmity towards Ahlul Bayt, you can't be uh, from Mahdi, of Mahdi. The second thing is, how will it be if someone is connected to Ahlul Bayt, and on the Day of Judgment, when we see our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Fatima Ali Hassan Hussein are behind him and with him. 
Because the hadith says they will be with me and they won't separate from me until the hold. How will that be? That's what I'm saying. This is important. This is a this is an issue. This is an important issue, right? So we we, we have to take this issue uh, 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 seriously. And I keep on saying when I close. Oh, it really in this one statement. I love this statement of Mufti Ahmed Qutaru, Rahmatullah Ta'ali. Sheikh Qutaru, who was the 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 former Grand Mufti of of Syria, who started uh, Jamia uh, Abi Nur or Abu Nur University, where, where several African Imam Wafdi Muhammad, may Allah reward him tremendously, where Imam Wafdi Muhammad sent many of the people in my generation to go study. And we can't thank him enough. And we have several people who went and studied uh, in, in Syria. Uh, Daoud, Imam Daoud Yassin, Imam Zaid Shakar, many people listened to the durus or the, or the, or the, 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 the lectures of Sheikh Ahmed Kutaro. Imam Suleiman Hamid giving the khutbah here. Right. Imam Mansour Sabri, who runs Imam, uh, Imam in Atlanta. You see? Imam Safiya Rabb. <clears throat> Dr. Intasar Rabb, who teaches at Harvard University. Dr. Suad Abdul Khabir. I can keep on going on. Some of the best of the best <laughs> sat and learned from Sheikh Kutaro. <laughs> Sheikh Kutaro said, <clears throat> If following the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, makes me Sunni, then I'm a Sunni. But if loving Ahlul Bayt, if loving the family of the Prophet Muhammad, if that makes me Shi'i, then by Allah I'm Shi'i. With that, Afwan Minkum, please pardon me, we will conclude with that. And I'll take any questions, uh, answers, or comments. And we have, uh, we have our Sheikhain, We have two of our imams who are here, right here, who can. If, if I left something out, they can elaborate. If I made any mistake, they can. Uh, they can correct me, obviously.